Wow, it's Halloween already? Well, guess what? It's Thanksgiving already. You missed it. You Okay, you ordered your costume on October 30th on Amazon, and you rushed delivered it. Well, guess what? Too late now. It's Thanksgiving. It's Thanksgiving. Now you got to dress like a skeleton to Thanksgiving. <laughs> and guess what? We're coming for your wishbone. <laughs> but we've got a wishbone for you, because for our November episode, that is one month from today, mm-hmm. we are doing one of our traditional Los Angeles, Los Angeles, LA Meekly, Mm -hmm. full name Los Angeles. Los Angeles Meekith, yeah. Where we want you, the listener, to send in things that we will talk about Mm -hmm. on the air. So this year, what we want you to send in are your favorite LA holiday time traditions, things you like to do around LA during the holiday times. If you've got a LA area Mm -hmm. holiday tradition you want to tell us about, you can send it to us at la.meekly at gmail.com or la underscore meekly on Instagram and do it quickly because you don't want to miss out because we're going to be recording the episode in just a few weeks. And if if you send it a day later, I don't care what you do on the- I'll laugh at your face. Yeah. And guess what? If you do send it too late, you can't do the tradition anymore. Nope. Yeah. We'll take it away from you. Legally, we're allowed to do that. Garcetti said we could. Yeah. Gosa said we <laughs> could do this. Sorry, Grandma. We're not coming over for this Thanksgiving because I forgot to send in my tradition <laughs> to Los Angeles Meekly. And I bet you're thinking, oh, I don't, I'm boring. I don't have traditions. Do you like to get pie from one place? Do you like to get mm-hmm. tamales from one place every year? What's the thing that you have to do every year? Exactly. That's what I'm looking for. Yeah. Where to get tamales? What what is your OCD? Yeah. <laughs> so send it in to us. We will read it on the air and we'll tell ours as well. And we'll mm-hmm. go over some historical traditions as well. And now it's time to get for our spooky-esque Ooh. October episode. <laughs> Boo. Uh, are we, is that all of Halloween? <laughs> yeah. All of Halloween. By the way, like every horror movie just amounts to that. Boo. Uh. <laughs> Boo. Boo. And to sum up my review of Long Legs. Nah. <laughs> Boo. Uh, uh. Bang a gong. Uh. Hey, they play Jewel too. Don't <laughs> be they, rude. They play Jewel? They, no, the, the T-Rex song Jewel, it opens with that. And I always wanted to have Jewel in a movie that I made, but it didn't happen because I'm nobody. And he took it from me. Another victim of long legs. Uh, who's he? Is the son of again? The director. Long is, legs. Um, oh, he's the son of Anthony Perkins. Anthony Perkins. Yeah. That's right. Oz another Perkins victim. Robbed my brain. <laughs> You're just another corpse in Anthony and mm-hmm. Oz Perkins's fruit basement. Fruit cellar in the fruit cellar. Right, fruit cellar. Not a. You stupid. You don't <laughs> even like Hitchcock. Do you even know that he walked on every <laughs> single? Do you know the guy who was holding the little Toto dogs? Do you know who that was? What's the one with the rope in it? <laughs> What's the one with the birds in it? <laughs> Wait a minute. What's the one with the strangers on a train in it? Wait a minute. <laughs> Acquaintances on an automobile. What was it? What's the one with the North by Northwest in it? <laughs> Men on a monorail. What was it? <laughs> so this is Los Angeles Meekly, <laughs> the LA history podcast. The most LA history podcast around other than the other four. They're, they're very popular. Sure, they only come out once a year, but they're quite popular. <laughs> sure, they only come out once a year and they don't cover history, but... Um, <laughs> but, you know, they come out once a year. <laughs> and that's more than enough. And they're incredibly hey, popular. Hey, if you've read the reviews of, of Los Angeles Meekly, well, now people are going to think that we're actually rebranding to Los Angeles Meekly. Why would I? We have to pay per letter. We do. We're going to cut Meekly down. It's going to be one E. This is like IHOP again. <laughs> it's just cheaper to put IHOP than uh, Los Angeles Meekly, mm-hmm. which is our Christian name, because yeah. this is... The Christian Los Angeles mm-hmm. History Podcast. Come on. The Christian Nationalist History Podcast. <laughs> Come on. Say uh, sorry, the whole title. The Christian Nationalist Socialist <laughs> History Podcast of Los Angeles. So this is Daniel Zafrin. This is Greg Gould Oh, yeah. Okay. So my my yeah. Halloween nickname is Daniel. Wait, what's what's something scary with a Z? Zafrin. <laughs> I'm always scared when what, I hear uh, it. Z, 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 Z. Oh, okay. Like you're sleeping. Because you're sleeping. And then guess what comes up when you're sleeping? Jewel. Singer from the 90s, Jewel. Singer from the 90s. She uh, A music video where she's sitting on the floor of a bathroom or something. I kind of remember. This is the show where we talk about Los Angeles history. But before we get into that, we have two new patrons. I am so excited. It's going to be Marley and Marley. It's going to be like two. Oh, that's Christmas, I guess. Eh, yeah. It's ghost, it's ghost it's, related. It's ghost related. It's the twins from The Shining, <laughs> the hallway. Yeah. 
He turns the corner. It's a great one of the greatest tracking shots I've ever seen in my life. Go ahead. We've got Freddy versus Jason joining <laughs> us this month. So we have two new people. Mm-hmm. First one we've got is Mike Block. Oh, hi, Mike Block. That's kind of a scary name. It is a little bit, but there's a lot of K's happening in it. It's Mike CH. Block. It's not Block. Oh, it's CH like Robert Block. <laughs> Yes. Like Robert Block. Like Robert Block. So it is scary. It is very scary. Yes. So we've got Mike Block. We don't have Robert Block, but we do have have Mike Mike Block. Block, And he's just as good. And he's the cousin of Mike Drop. (laughs) And then we have one other person who is Jessica Z. My sister. Your sister? My oh. sister. Another Z, 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 Z. I'd like to get dibs on your sister. She's not a postcard person, so stay off. Oh, the, you know, come on. Give me your address anyways. Every <laughs> every month you always off the air say, I got dibs on your sister. I have dibs on your sister. We finally caught it on air. And and get him. <laughs> Swarm him, boys. Sister alert. The sister police are going to come. <laughs> it's uh, Tia and Tamara going to come in and drag you out of here. So you too can, not you too, but you too, you as well, can support us on Patreon, patreon.com slash LA Meekly. And for as little as $1 a month, we will send you a sticker just for joining. And Mm -hmm. at the $5 level, we will send you a handwritten postcard every single month from a different place in Los Angeles, like Mike Block is getting. Mike Block. And I mean, your sister's in a special one. She gets my usual postcard that I send to my family every, every <laughs> she, month. She gets my uh, my hush money check in the mail once a month. Yeah. And she knows why. Well, that's the $15 <laughs> level. So uh, <laughs> patreon.com slash Ellie Makely, you too can become my sister if you support us on there. So now before we get- Everyone's in- going to drop. Everyone's going to stop paying. Oh, I didn't know those were part of the terms. <laughs> you agreed to it. Yeah, you're sorry. You just scrolled right through. Guess mm-hmm. what? You're my sister now. Yeah, guess Mike what? Block. And you owe me a present. It was about just my birthday. Yeah. And guess what, Mike Block? You still owe me a trip to Circuit City in 1997 because <laughs> you promised and you had a car. Yeah. But I don't even remember what I needed. They probably wouldn't have anything yeah. good now. Digital but. pogs or yeah. something. <laughs> now, before we get into October, yes. we have to talk about what we did in the month of yes. September. We do. Greg, what did you do in the month of September? Because I've got a big one. Okay. I've got a big one. Do you remember? Um, well... Me and my boys, my coworkers from boys. Sorny, we had a, you know, a going away party <laughs> that turned out to not be required. <laughs> uh, we celebrated at the Kibitz Room, which is the bar, the, di- the divey bar attached to um, Cantor's. Cantor's. Cantor's it, it's just a tiny, because we often wanted to do the open yes. mic that used to be there, but we never did. Parking was hard around there. Parking was too hard. Yeah. Uh, they say comedy's hard. Yeah, <laughs> Try parking around the kibitz yeah. room. Ooh, oh, <laughs> <laughs> um, there might be a redneck. Uh, yeah, uh, it was exactly. Uh, there was a band playing. Isn't that a really small room? Though? It's, a, it's a pretty tight room, and we were. It's sitting, narrow. It's narrow and long, which is a bad r- type bad of room. For comedy. To do, bad for comedy. We discovered over seven years. Great for pastrami. Oh my god, you can get pastrami yeah. right away. Give me the long one. <laughs> You share it with everybody. It's like a trough. <laughs> but you just <laughs> pastrami long. Nah. <laughs> yeah, but it was it was it hit the spot because I haven't been going to dive bars. I've been going to fancy fancy places. Mm. So in this dive bar, you've hit, been going to the main room of Cantor. Exactly. I've been going to the the oh they oh there's the lights are on here. <laughs> But I like to keep it from and I'll probably go back because I we had dinner there and I had one of the best salads I've ever had in my life at Cantor's. Really? Yeah. I haven't heard anybody say they've had the best anything at Cantor's. Oh, 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 except for um, the long pastrami. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I like Cantor's. Isn't that the, di- the, 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 the dive bar, as they call it? Didn't a lot of bands in the 80s play there? Probably, yeah. I think some punk bands played the Kibitz Room. I'm trying to Maybe remember the, where... The, not the Rolling Stones. The Rolling Chili Peppers? The Red Hot Chili the Peppers? The Rolling Hot Chili Punkers. I would imagine they would because they went to school right across the street. Yeah, they did. I think there was a story and we got the Neutron Bomb about Tom Waits fighting the guitars from the bags over hitting on <laughs> Alice Bag. At, At the, the Kibitz, Kibitz room, room, I think, if I'm remembering might have correctly. Been, might have been Genghis Cohen. They might have been coming out of the Ruka store. What is that? It's a skater shop that's not there anymore. That sold really good shirts. Now it's a Supreme. Yeah, it's Supreme. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, um, you thought the parking was hard. Now they're fighting in a Menchies. Who? <laughs> ah, who? Menchies. That's yogurt. <laughs> is, this the, is this thing a pastrami? <laughs> <laughs> Seeing ice cream? Oh, it's frozen yogurt. Oh, it's an ugly cousin of ice cream. 
Um, yeah, that's what I did this month. What did you do? So for my thing of the month, it is actually a very big announcement for all lovers of... Dun, dun, da, da. <laughs> dun, dun, da, da. Did you get the invitation in the mail? <laughs> uh, marrying a long pastrami. <laughs> uh, you, of course, remember uh, a couple of years ago and the year before that, Ellie Meekly did a calendar. Oh, my Los golly. Angeles history calendar, 365 But we're days. in 2024. We don't need calendars anymore, right? Obama, no, Obama, Obama. Obama's wow. back in office. <laughs> we don't need them in 2024. Yeah. But guess what? The world changed and now it's almost 2025. Uh-huh. Guess what? We've got a new calendar. <gasps> 2025 is a calendar year? But guess, <laughs> mark your calendar. <laughs> it's it's a calendar. 2025. <laughs> This one is different, though. This oh, tell is me different. about it. It's a little bit of a gamble for us financially. <laughs> Just in time for Halloween. Like I said, this is a different calendar. Uh-huh. So this is for Halloween and also for the year of 2025. Yes. We are selling our lived and died in L.A. 2025 monthly wall calendar. So I don't me, know what that means. Let me explain to you what that is. I'm a dumb dumb. Each day of the year has a different person of note, be that an actor, a writer, a scientist, politician, all sorts of people. Someone who was at the Kibitz room. Uh-huh. Samuel Kibitz. Yeah. All these people who died in Los Angeles oh. and also, so for every day of the year, somebody of note who died in Los Angeles and also where it was that they wow. died. Their house, the hospital, wherever it might have been. Interesting. Like our history a day calendar that we've done, but just for people whose lives have ended in LA. So the photos are of, there's some pictures of some of the homes that are mm-hmm. still around, which we tried so hard to go to Angela Lansbury's house and then we got there and it was totally gutted. Oh, like there no. were so many houses that just are no longer the house where this what person What area lived. was that in? Uh, that was Brentwood. Okay. Of course. Of course. Her house now has an entry on the calendar, huh? <laughs> uh, that's really good. We'll post some pictures on our Instagram and the website when this episode comes out of what the calendar looks like. We've got big name people you'd expect, like Charles Bukowski, mm-hmm. your Marilyn Monroe, yes. and then people you never knew lived in LA, let alone died in LA, like Truman Capote's on there. Right. Most of the names you're going to know, many you'll Google and say, oh yeah, I know this person. And then some you'll Google and want to know more yes. about them. It's perfect to get you in the mood for Halloween, mm-hmm. I think. And just because like, there's some ghosts, maybe? Because every calendar is printed on paper that they <laughs> took from a uh, an ancient sacred forest, mm-hmm, so it yeah. is haunted. And just like last time, they are going to be $35 shipping included. Cool. Limited run. Limited run. So Jump on we're going to see how many people are interested. So you want to get this fast. So you can email us la.meekly at gmail.com or contact us Instagram la underscore meekly or go to the website lameeklypodcast.com slash contact to get your 2025 lived and died in L.A calendar love it how incredibly grim and you know me i'm morbid i'm grim i like this stuff i'm gonna be like oh wow you know doing the research for the calendar i started getting really sad of like wow there's so many ways to die yeah. <laughs> but then as i like put it all together i was like well, this is kind of not like it's a good way to remember you know there's some people on here that nobody will be talking about in the year 2025, except for on this calendar. So it's kind of a nice way to to remember some people who might've been forgotten. Yeah. And you can see these houses or where they, where the house, where Angela (laughs) Lansbury's beautiful house used to be. I mean, I I think we're the same or sometimes we'll find out someone we like is buried in a cemetery nearby and I'm like, well, I want to go and I got to be there. (laughs) But I just this week found out that um, Jim Thompson, the writer, uh, pulp writer, who's really, I mean, one of my favorites, but he wrote like The Killer Inside Me and Pop 1280 is buried in the Westwood Cemetery. A lot of people are in, yeah, that, in the Westwood one, cemetery. right? Yeah. So I'm like, I don't know, take a stroll around there. <laughs> I got to move in there. I got to move in there. But that's another thing that revealed a lot about these people is where they died. Yeah. Because like some of the, you know, it's like, wow, what a beautiful house that Ira Gershwin died in. Yeah. Or it's like, wow. Wow. Right outside the Viper Room, huh? <laughs> yeah. Right outside. Wow. The, do- the Indian Dunes in Castaic. <laughs> but like, you know, it, it really shows a lot about how this person's life went or how it ended. Abruptly, yeah. Not even abruptly, just like what a slow decline this person's fame had or how great this person had it. Yeah. It's really interesting. I think you should buy it. You. I'm talking you. to you. Uh, I mean, I certainly never get anything free. So I'll yeah. give you the LA Meekly discount. $70, <laughs> $70 a calendar. dollars <laughs> Cash right now. Yeah, right now or close. <laughs> So now it's time to actually get into oh. October, uh, Rocktober. Rocktober, for some. Yeah. If you observe, it is Rocktober. Shacktober, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so this is, as we do every year, it's our Halloween, but it's spooky, but not scary. We save sure. that for December. So for this month, we are doing secret, and that is in quotations, heavy. secret societies yes. around 
Los Angeles. And the secret is, how do we get people to notice us? The secret is the marketing. One of my favorite things about The Breakfast Club is that they're like a a play on a secret society, which is yeah, so funny. They're like a morning secret society. They're like the elves to the orcs. Exactly. Thank you. That's exactly what it is. I've yeah. been watching a lot of Rings of Power. That's sad. That's a, oh, you come. shouldn't do that. You should watch Tokyo Vice with me and we could talk about. <laughs> do they have rings? Is so- they do. Is Celebrimbor s- in it? Greg? You see rings as fingers are getting cut off. <laughs> it happens in the show. Yeah. It happens in Rings of Power too. <laughs> you haven't seen the first 10 minutes of uh, Fellowship of the Ring? <laughs> those, those fingies come off. Sauron is not going to play piano anymore. <laughs> there are. You know what? I didn't realize that. There are a lot of fingers that got get cut off in mm-hmm. Lord of the Rings. In Star Wars, it's arms. It's arms. In Lord of the Rings, it's fingers. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, in Dune, it's toes. I think I have my new topic for my, um, my master's thesis. <laughs> in Tolkien literature. The fingers are quite vulnerable. <laughs> the many fingers of Tolkien's religious <laughs> influence. Okay, so we've got three secret societies yes. here for you. And again, in quotations. And if we die at the end of this episode, you know who did it. Yeah, you know who three. did it. It was probably Celebrimbor. <laughs> it may have been Arondir, <laughs> a.k.a. Sauron. I'm, my eye is on you, Elrond. I hate, I hate <laughs> this. I hate this. is such fan fiction. Go ahead. So I am, it's all fan fiction. Every, everything's fan fiction. Everything's fan fiction because this is a true story that Tolkien wrote about. Tolkien wanted to make the Bible. He just, he's like, I, if I could uh, imagine God was, and then he makes Lord of the Rings. I imagine God. God had hairy feet. <laughs> oh, oh, oh do I. does. <laughs> All right, I'm going to get into my first one. Are you yes, ready for please, this? Yes. ISO, these are ISO, UFO, FWB, DTF, NSA. Is this like a, are we playing Scrabble? Like <laughs> yeah. no pieces? These are all my, I have no vowels. <laughs> You'll, you can play that back and decipher what I'm saying. So, I think banana, you had a lot of A's. So this, <laughs> I, I didn't use any of those, and I just made the word the, <laughs> which is how I play Scrabble. So the group I am first going to be talking about is, and the name, I couldn't not do research on this just based on the name, the Amalgamated Flying Saucer Clubs of America. Mm-hmm. Yep. that You Google that. I have had this in my little notebook of ideas for years, and like this has to, and as I was doing it, it's like, well, this isn't really secret, but it's secret-esque. It, the secret is I want to talk about that. <laughs> So this very weird group that I would absolutely join was started by a man named Gabriel Green. GG. That's another abbreviation. Is that part of your Scrabble? Is that your Scrabble move? My Scrabble move is my initials. I'm going to have to look that up in the dictionary (laughs) to see if that's a word. (laughs) The dictionary. So he was born November 11th, 1924, right here in Whittier. Ah. He claimed he got a PhD in physics from Berkeley in 1953 and that he made very important contributions to the standard model of particle physics theory. But for whatever reason, this slightly more modern day Einstein was working as a photographer for LAUSD. When the he arts graduated. called him. Yeah. The arts. <laughs> Sorry, Oppenheimer. I can't work on your project in Manhattan. I can't take the weather. I must take pictures of homeless people in downtown. <laughs> For LAUSD. Yeah. <laughs> I got to take pictures of the Chalupa this week. <laughs> I got to make this look good for those kids. So it was during this time that he had an encounter that changed him forever. A close encounter of somewhere between the second and fourth kind. Uh-huh. Gabriel Green saw a UFO. Whoa. And it wasn't just a, uh, a notebook being thrown through the air by Matt Zombo. At my, that's my LAUSD <laughs> experience. That's great. I'm... Green with envy that he saw a UFO because his last name was Green. Go ahead. <laughs> I'm Gabriel <laughs> Iglesias. <laughs> <laughs> I'm fluffy about it. <laughs> so because of this, he started becoming obsessed with the idea of UFOs cool. and started believing some strange things, not only about the universe, but also about himself. Mm-hmm. He claimed that he made telepathic contact with an extraterrestrial group called the Space Masters and also the Great White Brotherhood, which is also an extraterrestrial group and not a group in Sing Sing. Yeah, I was about to say, yeah. So I guess a lot of people believe in the Great White Brotherhood. I bet they do. And (laughs) and that they are, I guess the thing is that they're perfect beings of great power who pass on spiritual teachings through select humans. And Gabriel Green was one of these humans. Okay. He believed. Yeah. He also said he rode in a spaceship with the Space Brothers, which is an underrated Jim Belushi class. Classic. Um, <laughs> but regardless, they always go sci-fi next. The they sequel, always, they always go first, sci-fi. It's classic. Yeah. Then it's 2000. 
and then it's in space. <laughs> <laughs> so, and then it's on Treasure Island. <laughs> but regardless of how weird everything I just said was, he actually got a good message out of this, which was that UFOs were friendly and wanted to share their knowledge with humans to solve our earthly problems. Okay. However, he knew that when the UFOs started arriving en masse, the world would not be accepting of them. So he set out to create a society that would promote a normalization of US UFOs and USOs. Yeah. He worked with Bob Hope. Yep. So that the general public would accept them when that day came okay. of the USOs. I know that this is War of the Worlds. Hear them out. <laughs> I know they're blowing up cities and, and and sucking a bunch of people into the mothership. Give them a minute. They're misunderstood. Yeah. And I know they said something about a cookbook. It's unrelated. <laughs> Don't sneeze on them. No. <laughs> I know you're tempted to. Do not sneeze on them. So he named this society the Amalgamated Flying Saucer Clubs of America. This sounds like a like a Grateful Dead band. I, I was thinking this is like flying a burrito brothers. Isn't this the company that JD Rockefeller owned? No. <laughs> But this wasn't a secret society that would meet in the basement of Harvard. This was a countrywide society connected Whoa. via the mail by sending people the magazine he started called Los Angeles Interplanetary Study Groups that in 1956 he renamed to Thy Kingdom Come. Cute. That's stupid. I hate that. The other name was better. What a cool fandom to send stuff in the mail to each other or ham radio. Those two ways to connect as a social group. I'm, I want it to be part of that. And it's also a different, like it's a society secret, quote unquote, yeah, quote unquote. of a different kind where there it's not, you know, it's like- A third kind. Uh, <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Sorry, I cut you off. It's almost, you know, like- it was like chat rooms of the yeah. day, which don't exist now. No. It was like Discord servers of the. It was like skibbity toilets of, uh, <laughs> of the of the fifties. It was like blink blink. That's gonna. That's right around the corner. Oh, you haven't heard about blink blink yeah, yet? Blink blink. Oh yeah yeah no no yeah yeah. You wouldn't have. You're so flappy. <laughs> um, you'll understand that. Your kids are going to be offended by it. But it, yeah, it, it's it's almost like a more modern, ancient society sort of thing. Of mm. like, we're not just meeting in one place; we're meeting everywhere all yeah. at once. So the mission statement of the magazine was to help create greater understanding and cooperation between the people of Earth and the people of space to help disseminate to the Earth's peoples the solution to their problems, to help initiate through political and economic action the procedures for providing abundance for all, to help establish the universal brotherhood of all mankind and the kingdom of heaven on Earth. And all this for the low, low price of $3 a year. That's oh, all you have to pay. I could afford that. I could afford the kingdom yeah. on Does Earth. Does he have a for- Patreon? <laughs> What does the, the heaven on earth have to do with aliens? Is it uh, because they were going to come and bring their secrets to to turn earth into a paradise, to mm. bring about world peace, to cure all problems, all right. diseases? Well, that puts a lot of pressure on them. Uh, they could handle it. <laughs> they're superior. Yeah. Uh, Greg, the Great White Brotherhood, you think they can't handle this? <laughs> Jesus is white, by the way. Uh huh. <laughs> what? What? What was that? <laughs> But yeah, that, that that was what Thy Kingdom was. Oh, uh, got it. That included this $3 a year, included a subscription to this monthly magazine, a membership card, cool. a Flying Sauces Are Real button, and four Flying Sauces Are Real stamps for you oh. to use on Patreon. On your- <laughs> yeah, for <laughs> What if God had a Patreon? <laughs> <laughs> he ran all this out of his house at 2004 North Hoover in Los Feliz. The house is still oh, there. Oh, wow, okay. Uh, not on the calendar, though. I don't know where he died. Because he's still alive. Because he died on Mars. <laughs> the magazine was filled mostly with things members would send in, like messages they claim to have gotten from aliens, like getting rid of nukes and abolishing money. And this was a weird one. Never land on the moon. I don't know why. Okay. Like Peter Pan Neverland? Yeah. <laughs> Never right? Land on the moon. No, it was like Michael Jackson's house on the moon. Yeah, it's the mansion with the chimp. Never land man like on the moon. Kids. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the alien, I don't know what it meant, but the <laughs> aliens said it. So people would send in sightings and pictures that they had taken. Others were articles about extraterrestrial possibilities. Okay. So it was a secret kind of society where believers in this sort of thing could find community and share stories and ideas with other nutjobs. They even had a convention on July 11th and 12th, 1959 at the Statler Hilton Hotel downtown, which was the former Wilshire Grand since demolished and replaced with the current Wilshire Grand. In 1959, he renamed the magazine World Report and then UFO International in 1961. And by the early 60s, the organization had 5,000 members in 24 different countries. Green was even on Art Linkletter's show, People Are Funny, on February 21st, 1959. He was also a write-in candidate to be president of the United States in 1960. How did he do? Oh, you don't remember President Green? (laughs) (laughs) 
Uh, thanks, Obama. <laughs> he was running with the Universal Flying Saucer Party. Uh-huh. Uh, I don't think he became president of the United States, but he must have come in second. Yeah, he must have. Co- he was. It was really tight. Yeah, it was Kennedy, Nixon, Gabriel Green of the United, mm-hmm. the of Universal the Flying Saucer. Yeah, party. and Nixon got beat at the debate again twice by a UFO. By a UFO, who was, who was better looking than <laughs> yeah, him? No, he still looked more sweaty than, <laughs> than a person from Mars. Over the radio, the alien was really struggling, but once I saw him on TV, I'm like, I can vote. <laughs> This guy. He's Catholic. He's from Beta Gamma What? (laughs) So then he ran in the primary for U.S. Senator in 1962 Mm -hmm. under a ban the bomb platform where he claims he got 171,000 votes. But there were no secret handshakes or animal sacrifices in this secret society. But rather, they believed that they were the ones holding the secret that had to be shared with the rest of all of us. That aliens were coming and we needed to stop hurting and killing each other before they got here or else they'd see us and run away. But by 1969, the Amalgamated Flying Saucer Clubs of America was done. And if the aliens did come, they kept on moving right past us. Green ran again for president in 1972, where he got an overwhelming 21 votes. Cool. And then he died September 8th, 2001 in Yucca Valley. And that is all that's known about this probably weird guy who was probably lying. No, that's not true. No. This isn't a secret society. It's a society with a secret. <laughs> yeah, I and guess so. And we want so. to tell you so bad. <laughs> they, please just give me $3 and I want it. I can tell <laughs> you, you my everything, secret. Everything, yeah. I like that that existed, though. You know what I mean? I would, yeah, like... In 1950, yeah. I would have totally signed up for this. Oh, yeah, no, I know. If have... I had $3, which I don't even have now. I don't know. I mean, if I collected bottles and cans for like a week straight, I could get $3. <laughs> or unless I saw a pop on the way home. <laughs> I'd be uh, on the side of the freeway holding a sign, I want to join the Amalgamated <laughs> Flying Saucers Club. Uh, it's a racist thing. It's only about and white I have children. <laughs> yeah. I, I want to join the White Brotherhood. <laughs> so that was my first society. What, what's your secret society, <sighs> quote unquote, that we have? I'm going to be talking about... The ah, ha, 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 a little oh, secret laddie. society called Ireland. <laughs> <laughs> Don't trust them. <laughs> I'm going to be talking about the Philosophical Research Society, the esoteric, mystical, secret oh. society that wishing it wasn't a secret society that actually would really like it if you stopped by. <laughs> the Philosophical Research Society, or the PRS, has all the makings of a scary secret society. They inhabit an old Mayan revival structure on Los Feliz Boulevard. <gasps> Their figurehead was an all-knowing lecturer of multicultural wisdom. On the grounds, they hold mystical and historical artifacts, and the group is comprised of curious individuals interested in spirits and the occult, among many other religions and philosophical beliefs. Bring out the robes and paddles, but really it's a non-profit with a library and a gift shop, and they'd really <laughs> like if you stopped by 3910 Los Feliz Boulevard, Alley, California, 90027. It, you could stop by. $3 a year. $3 a year. Check the hours on the website. I guess because yes. I thought that was the place we walked by when we were in that neighborhood above Hollywood, but I guess that wouldn't no, be No, that's not that's it. That's not Los Feliz. That's not Los Feliz Boulevard. This one is right at Griffith Park. If you are on the same street as Marshall going and you connect with Los Feliz Boulevard to make that, you know, some people will make a left. I think they're stupid for doing that. <laughs> you make a right and you go down to uh, Griffith Park where the Friendship Auditorium is. The Philosophical Research Society was founded by one man with an extraordinary name. Are you ready for it? Yeah. Manly Palmer Hall. Oh my God. Manly Palmer Hall was born in Ontario, Canada in 1901. Just to set your brain to this guy before we start, Manly Palmer Hall is a prolific author, lecturer, astrologer, mystic, showman, and Freemason. He's also where the math classes are at UCLA. <laughs> he is part Amy Semple McPherson, part mm. Houdini All Virgin. <laughs> that I actually don't know. I just wanted to. Ask it. His father was a dentist who had abandoned the family pretty early on, and his mother was a chiropractor, but more importantly to Hall, Louise, his mother, was a member of the Rosicrucian Fellowship. Oh, okay. I know the Rosicrucians. Tell me, what do you know about them? Because I like copy and pasted something about their religious beliefs and how you are born with mystical wisdom. I don't, I guess I don't know. I know that they exist. Yeah. I think I might be thinking of Zoroastrians. Maybe. That was mentioned somewhere in here too. Uh, <laughs> just as a, we cover them That's too. their mortal enemy. <laughs> it's like a West Side Story. It's like the sharks <laughs> and the jets. When you're a Rosicrucian, it did it. It was a first draft. Yeah, it, it threw the vowels way They off. couldn't cast anybody who could sing it. <laughs> Natalie Wood could play anybody. She was really good. Yeah, they put her in Rosicrucian face. (laughs) Doing a quick reading about Rosicrucianism, it seemed devoted to a combination of occultism and other religious belief, which included Hermeticism, Jewish mysticism, Mm -hmm. and Christian Nazism. What? 
Christian Nazi- Nazism? Na- Christian Nazi- socialist nationalism? It's Christian Gnosticism with a G. Oh, okay. It seems like a central feature of Rosicrucianism is its belief that members possess secret wisdom that was handed down to them from ancient times. Okay. Well, I couldn't figure this out, but it seems like Hall... Uh, okay, this is separate. Yes, well, somebody isn't a Rosicrucian. I guess you, only, you weren't born with a secret knowledge of what Rosicrucianism <laughs> means. Drop your pants. Let me see if you're actually a Rosicrucian. <laughs> Your pee will bleed if I cut it, if you aren't. <laughs> they tie what? it into a knot. <laughs> tie it and throw it. Well, I couldn't figure this out, but it seems like Hall was raised by his grandmother in Canada while his mother was living in Santa Monica in Southern California, the mecca of weirdo religions. <laughs> in 1904, at the age of three, he moved with his grandmother to Sioux Falls, South Dakota. But in 1919, I can't figure out if him and his grandmother moved to Southern California or his grandmother died and they both moved. Or he just moved there by himself to just find like a parent figure. But in 1919... <laughs> That's why everyone goes to Santa Monica. Grandma died. But I need I, a parent figure. I'm going <laughs> what are to, you doing? I'm going to the Third Street Promenade. <laughs> in 1919, he moves to Santa Monica to reunite with his Bohemian mother. 1919, of course, I mentioned in almost every episode, was the dawn of Los Angeles becoming a major metropolitan city. And here's the kid dropped right into the lap of his mother, who's living an exciting beach life, studying ancient religious and esoteric beliefs. And Manly Palmer Hall falls right into this spot. This child is Manly Palmer Hall. Yeah, he's okay. 18 now. In 1919, he is like 18. Now he is a Manly. Today now I am a Manly. <laughs> he used to be Boily. Yeah, he used to be Boily. Boily Palmer uh, Hall. Boily. His biography pages all mention he was interested in ancient wisdom traditions from an early age, and he knew enough to know that wisdom was not found in just one religion or solely in any religion, but a mishmash of different beliefs along with science and philosophy. He sounds like a great hang. Um, (laughs) But once he was in Santa Monica living with his bohemian mystic mother, his interest in these teachings really blossomed and it became his like whole being, like his whole entire existence is mystic ancient learnings and religious beliefs. You know, that's another thing I realized based both of our last two stories Uh of these secret societies, much like there's a fine line between religion and cult. Yeah. There's also a fine line between cult and secret society. Yeah. Yeah. And there's a lot of crossover. (laughs) Yeah. I think, I mean, like if you can beat a bunch of people up and no one knows about it, you're a secret society. If everyone finds out, <laughs> yeah. you're a cult. Caught, the second you get caught, yeah. it's like... Um, if you drive up to Yellow Drive, you're a cult. You might be a you cult. You might be a cult. It, it's like... What, what am I thinking? It's like something that, when exposed to light, becomes something else. It's yeah. like Schrodinger's cat. Of- yeah, the, yeah, exactly. That's a good way to put it. I think. Um, <laughs> Let me ask the Rosicrucians. <laughs> it seems like there was a point where he got really into Rosicrucianism, like his mother, and moved to Oceanside to the fellowship building founded by Mex Heindel, who is said by a Rosicrucian website to be the greatest Western mystic of the 20th century, which is like talking about like which wizard is best. I don't know. <laughs> and coming from a Rosicrucian. Yeah, gotta believe it. Anyways, our boy Manly Palmer Hall is living at the headquarters in Oceanside, but really isn't digging the vibes. He doesn't feel like this group is... Oceanside, San Diego? I think so. Okay. Yeah. Oceanside, California, which is in like (laughs) Southern, Southern California. Uh, I recognize San Diego as its own state. Okay. And Jefferson. I believe in Jefferson. And... And the rest. And the rest. (laughs) Um... But it isn't, he isn't digging the vibes there. He doesn't think that they're actually tapping into ancient wisdom. So he comes back to Los Angeles with his mother. He comes back and continues attending lectures, going to discussion groups with other metaphysical seekers and asking all the hard questions. And that's when he hears about phrenology, Mm -hmm. which supposes, I don't know if you don't know. (laughs) And that's when he learned racism. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I agree with a lot of these slave traders. No. (laughs) Which supposes, if you don't know what phrenology is, that human psychology is dependent on the physical shape of your skull. And racists would use that to say that some people are not um, equal to others. There are different skulls that make you bad. And this is not good uh, science. (laughs) And he's interested in it. So he looks into it and ends up at the shop of Sidney J. Brownson. Now, I could not find out where or what this shop was. But according to two articles, his quote-unquote shop was a booth on the Santa Monica Pier. <laughs> the guy who'd study phrenology, he couldn't get rent space. He couldn't afford a, a shack. <laughs> Would you care to meet me in my dining room? <laughs> and he goes under the pier and it's just like... Yeah. Well, that's in the basement. <laughs> Ever, all of the fish bones being thrown over the side from the restaurant up Oh, that's there. on the fishing wing. <laughs> You're talking about the carnival wing. That's the fishing wing. (laughs) But anyways, Brownson was said to be a diminutive horse and buggy doctor and Civil War veteran in his early 70s who had set up business as a practitioner of phrenology. Uh, What's a horse and... Oh, like he rode... Like old-timey, I guess. Okay, not like a mechanic. Uh, No, no. He was not like the the hatbox ghost. (laughs) 
He's not like Hatbox Ghost. <laughs> His interest in esoteric studies was piqued after having a mystical experience during a battle in the Civil War, which I cannot find more information about. Since then, he studied Hinduism, Greek philosophy, Christian mysticism, among many, many, many other non-American beliefs and ancient religions. Brownson was impressed by Hall and took him on as a student and friend, and the two shared a love of occult lore. Again, these guys sound like they're having a great time together. <laughs> what a cool hang this must be. It was through Brownson who would hold court to a small audience in a room above a bank that Manly Palmer Hall would begin his public lectures. This is the beginning of what I call spooky Amy Simple McPherson, her evil counterpart, although only one of them faked a kidnapping to run with their boyfriend. The <laughs> answer might surprise you. Back to the lecture. His first lecture was on reincarnation, and it was a pass the hat lecture where he got 65 cents. And from you're saying he's not the hat box ghost. And he's... He's not the hat box ghost. Just don't look in the hat. You got to You got to <laughs> trust me on this. I know that when you look in the hat, his head disappears. Um, he got 65 cents past the hat from eight people. It was more than we made doing comedy. Anyway, <laughs> if I have the timeline right, this gig leads into another one. Hall is said to be a tall guy. He's like 6'4", incredibly confident and charismatic. And he's not the hat box ghost. He's not the hat. Okay. It's kind of strange because he fits the description so perfectly. <laughs> Tall guy, six foot four, incredibly confident, charismatic, born natural public speaker. So he went from attending the Church of the People at the Trinity Auditorium in downtown, 851 Grand between 8th and 9th, if you're wondering. He went from attending to getting ordained by that church and then becoming a preacher and leading processions like really quick. He like jumped rank. Like I want to stay within the span of weeks, maybe. He soon became a permanent pastor of the church and spoke about all the spiritual and philosophical thinkings he had studied, which is pretty, I don't want to say progressive, but like for you to go to like a Catholic church. Well, actually, I don't know what kind of church. It's a church of the people. I guess you can. <laughs> he soon started putting his beliefs on paper, releasing two small pamphlets, the breastplate of the high priest and wands and serpents. Over the next two years, he wrote another three, uh, last being the Lost Keys of Freemasonry in March of 1923. As minister, he was also collecting followers, which included Caroline and Estelle Lloyd, a mother and daughter pair that came from a wealthy oil family from Ventura. Now, the Lloyd women would generously fund Hall's travels around the world that would allow him to become the Manly Palmer Hall that is remembered by the PRS. He would continue to study and be inspired and collect text, firsthand materials. He would be collecting this stuff, that, which are now part of the like historic, like historical text. So this guy's kind of like the um, the guy who has that other place in Los Feliz. Uh, yes, God, yes. What's his name? I don't remember his name. No, it's in Silver Lake. But yeah, Silver Lake. Um, God. Judd? Uh, no. F Antonio Fooderer. Yes, Fooderer. Yeah, Furderer. Antonio Applefritter. Yeah, Furderer. Yeah, he's, so he's so collecting- like an Indiana Jones type. Uh, Indiana Jones type. But like uh, celibate. <laughs> celibate, no matter how much he begs. Um, he's an incel. He's, uh, he's incel. Uh, incel, incel Deanna Jones. <laughs> this guy shagged, okay? Uh, I think. <laughs> he boogied. He boogied. They would fund his trips. He would travel around the world. These trips would be the foundation of his tome, his masterwork, among many, 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 many other works. <laughs> he spent six years researching and collecting to create his encyclopedic masterpiece in 1928, The Secret Teachings of All Ages. This is his big, giant encyclopedia okay. he writes about. I'll get into it. But just to say this part, he had to raise $100,000 in 1928 to get oh the God. first edition printed. What? Why would it cost that much to make a book? Uh, it doesn't even cost that much now to make it, a book. It was a giant book. It was a big <laughs> friggin' encyclopedia. Oh, yeah. It was made out of emeralds. Did, oh, yeah. We're not supposed to do that. <laughs> that must, it makes the book work. Um, that is close to $2 million today. I, how could that? Like, I could literally, a, I could get a book. <laughs> he's printing a book. It's $2 million. But if you're going to do that kind of thing, boy, was 1928 the year to do that. Couldn't do that in November of 1929. <laughs> Am I right? And then the Great Depression hits. But that's next year's problem. 1928. The secret teaching of all ages is a comprehensive testament to the occult, arcane, esoteric beliefs that have shaped human civilizations throughout time. The scope of this work was stunning and included over 200 beautifully illustrated works by John Augustus Knapp. Hall covers secret societies, alchemy, cryptology, mm -hmm. um, the Kabbalah, the tarot, pyramids, the zodiac, Pythagorean philosophy, masonry, gemology, the Hiramic legend, the tree of Sephiroth, and mystic Christianity, among many other subjects. So this is like, I, I bet if we went to the psychic eye, this book would be there. Yeah, probably. Would. Or some knockoff of it. Yeah. And I bet you it didn't cost $100,000 to print no, it. No, I don't think it would. It would cost like at least like 
maybe like 50 grand. Um, <laughs> what, what does a book cost these days? $800,000? <laughs> a copy of this and most of his work is actually available free on the Internet Archive if you want to check there some of go. that out. In the preface. Why didn't he just use the Internet Archive? It's always been around. It's called a time machine. It's it's an archive. It's a way back machine. It's an yeah. archive, so it must be old. <laughs> he probably robbed that too. <laughs> remember the the archive of Alexandria <laughs> that got burned down because of a loose firewall? Yeah, remember? Um, <laughs> in the preface, Hall states, the entire theory of the book is diametrically opposed to the modern method of thinking, for it is concerned with subjects openly ridiculed by the sophists of the 20th century. Its true purpose is is to introduce the mind of the reader to a hypothesis of living wholly beyond the pale of materialistic theology, philosophy, or science. So is this just, this, this sounds, this rhetoric sounds a lot like Aleister Crowley a little sort of stuff. A bit. Less horny. Yeah, where it's less like, demon-y. you've never thought like this. Yeah. How about you think without your shirt on? Yeah, basically. Uh, we have to unlock this demon. It's just like a circle jerk. <laughs> and you're like, well, that's right. what I call it. <laughs> That's what most of gatherings are. All right, everybody. As Kathy Koning of the Library Journal reviews, the, she reviews a new edition in 2003. She, she has this to say about his work. The classic of the occult must be read with an open mind since many biases of the time are evident. For example, Hall states categorically that Francis Bacon is the real author of Shakespeare's works <laughs> and that the true, quote unquote, facts concerning the identity of Jesus are to be found only in the, quote unquote, secret vaults beneath the houses of the brethren. Settle down there, Indiana Jones. Um, <laughs> The great white brethren? The great white brethren, yeah. I also went through, I just searched his name on Reddit at two in the morning because I was awake. <laughs> and a lot of people, these nerds. And How these much karma does he have? These nerds in these subreddits are just like, he's honestly, you know, read all his stuff with a grain of salt. Like he gets, <laughs> I mean, his masonry work is not that thorough. Like, oh, Jesus <laughs> Christ, guys, come on. You all sound so cool. Um, <laughs> the book for costing $100 in 1928 was very popular. In the it cost $100? In 1928. That's crazy. Yeah. They needed to save that money for 1929. Yeah. If they, only, <laughs> they only knew they'd be eating their shoe in a year. I, uh, I can't eat this book. <laughs> it costs too much money. Yeah. I need to know about horny old religions. <laughs> I can't eat this book. It was very popular in the social circles of the metaphysical movement. And he established himself as a major player in that world. From that point, he continued writing and publishing and giving lectures. So it's 1934 and Manly Palmer Hall decides... It's time to build an institution. So at the corner of Los Feliz Boulevard in Griffith Park still stands a pale pink mine revival structure designed by our old pal, Robert Stacy Judd, who designed the Aztec Hotel in Monrovia and several mm. homes in Elysian Park. We covered him in another episode. When Hall, I don't listen to this show. I, this is actually the worst podcast I've ever heard. When Hall first bought the plot of land that the PRS sits on, he paid $10. Wow. Yeah. That, you know how many books he could have printed? With that? <laughs> Two pages of one <laughs> book. Have, that's a sentence in his book. <laughs> the first part of the structure was built in 1935 with additions added in 1959. It holds a bookstore, a museum, a gallery, two lecture halls, and a library consisting of 50,000 items. It's said to secretly hold black magic books, but Uh-oh. there's no confirmation on that. It would be here that Manly Palmer Hall would establish his school, the Philosophical Research Society, which we've kind of have been getting to <laughs> a modern version of the school of Pythagoras, 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 meaning it's more of an intellectual society who discusses concepts of mysticism, philosophy, and science and such and such like an open discourse. Basically it's not like an open it's, secret. It's an open, an open secret. secret society. It's an open secret society and there's no homework, but you have to like BS <laughs> with everybody in a circle and no shoes. It was a place to learn about wisdom from sources all over the world, all over time. And as Hall put it, this society would be, quote unquote, dedicated to the ensoulment of all arts, sciences, and crafts. And proof that the Philosophical Research Society isn't a secret society can be seen, first of all, on the building where it reads in big letters, <laughs> University of Philosophical Research. But guess what? So does the Scientology building. Oh, you got me there. Yeah, you got me there. We don't know who Tom Cruise has chained up in those buildings. <laughs> We don't know what Elizabeth Olsen is doing coming outside of that building at 11 o'clock at night when you and I are filming a video. I don't think that was the Scientology. I think that was a bar she came out of. The bar of Scientology. The bar of Scientology, yeah. Um, always defending Elizabeth Olsen. What about the other two? What about Mary Kay and Ashley? To, they know what they did. They know what they did. They're with Tia and Tamara. 
also prove that they're not a secret society weekly through the decades in the LA Times as they were they were constantly promoting lectures that they were happening at the campus. <laughs> One of them was about beatniks, which is funny. It's a secret the same way the location of my keys when I'm late to work is a secret. <laughs> I just didn't know it was there. I don't know where. <laughs> what? To this day, they have articles written about them in the Los Angeles Magazine and Atlas Obscure, and it's a thoroughly modern institution that seems incredibly welcoming. They show movies there as well. In February, they showed one of my favorite horror movies, Hagazuza, at this spooky old place. The Karen Dalton documentary played on the 26th, which I missed because I was writing this segment. They have readings, workshops, lectures, sound baths. Cabinet of Dr. Calgary is playing on 16 mm-hmm. millimeter with a live score on the 11th of October. You can go hmm. to this if you are listening to this episode right now. But what religion do I have to be? You have to be Calgary. <laughs> You have to go to medical school, the same medical school that yeah. Dr. Calgari, when all the buildings are like crooked and weird and stuff. And it, it's about like Germany post-war. You have to know how to do surgery and shadows yeah. and cheer us, cure us. <laughs> The beginning of film noir. The sorority is somehow more like Metropolis. <laughs> Please check in on the secret society. They want you to come. Stay for a lecture on theology if that's your thing, Ray Camacho. You're listening. Yeah, he's not listening. He's not listening. He's not listening to um, this. In the eighties, politician Marianne Williamson, who is currently running for president, started giving talks because if you remember that thing about her, she's like a new age hippie author, and she had a self study program titled "A Course in Miracles," happening out of the Philosophical Research Society. This is the sort of things that secret societies discuss. It's yeah. just they decided to open their doors to everybody. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, no robes, no pee pee smashing or anything. Well, we don't know that. We don't. We actually, haven't been. Don't know that. I don't know. After hours. Did you see what they're doing after the cabinet of doctors? Actually, Calgary? put on the calendar pee pee smashing. Yeah, refreshments and pee pee smashing. Pee pee smashing candles followed by followed by. We have a goat. Um, <laughs> we didn't name it. Ask me why. Also, I didn't look into this, but apparently. People say that Ronald Reagan used phrases and ideas in his City on the Hill speech from The Secret Destiny of America, which is a speech that Manly Palmer Hall wrote. Hmm. Uh, Ronnie and- You think he was a secret member? I think Ronnie, I mean, Ronnie and Nancy were really into astrology, so- The maybe. actor. The actor? The, thea- the, th- the two actors? <laughs> the theologist? The theologist? The, the jelly bean theologist? <laughs> Back to Manly Palmer Hall, though. In 1942, he gave a lecture at Carnegie Hall on the secret wow, destiny of America. that's big for him. Yeah, it is. Hall on hall. <laughs> hall on the hall. <laughs> they phrased it. I didn't write down the exact phrase, but they're like, it was well attended. I'm like, oh, it wasn't cool. <laughs> it was very attended. You know how you get to Carnegie Hall? You start a theoth- philosophical <laughs> Open society. A church. You, get a, you, you get a church. really big book. Well, you have to be born in Sioux Falls or <laughs> whatever, whatever you said. Whatever you said 20 All that stuff ago. I don't actually remember. <laughs> and then he returned three years later for another lecture on Plato's prophecy of worldwide democracy, new world order. <laughs> His career spanned over 70 years and he gave over 8,000 lectures, wrote something like 150 books and ex- essays. He spent $1.5 million writing books. <laughs> <laughs> Each book's a million dollars. He appears as a narrator and introduces a 1938 film, When You Were Born, which is a murder mystery involving astrology. Uh, How Hollywood he went. (laughs) Bet he could fight Criswell. Um, (laughs) After his death, his rare alchemy books were sold to the Getty Research Institute to keep the PRS going. I'll explain that in a moment because I wrote that before I did research on this last bit. Well, I guess that's it. Not No spooky occult stuff here. Wait. Here we go. 1954, Bandwick Palmer Hall was initiated, passed, and raised as a Freemason in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. In December of 1973, he was recognized as a level 33 Mason, the highest honor conferred by the Supreme Council of the Scottish Rite at a Mm -hmm. ceremony held at the PRS. Fine. Great. Solid. In 1990, Hall dies. Fine. He was old. He was like 89 years old. But the internet is very, very hush about his death. It's kind of strange. He's scared. Phantom the Cat just pawed at the notes so that he would stop saying these scary things. Yeah, I'm sorry, buddy. I'm sorry. Close your ears. Close your ears. Close your, okay, put his earmuffs on. Yeah, put his earmuffs on. They're shaped like little fish. <laughs> if any of the articles even mention his death, which many don't, which I found very strange, it's simply that he passed away and his students carry on his legacy. He was an old man. He, he was born in 1901, died in 1990. People die. His obit says he died in his sleep of natural causes. But Louis Sahagun, author of Master of Mysteries, a M.P. Hall biography, Sahagun writes, Hall's body was found under suspicious and horrifying circumstances, Mm. apparently dead for hours and with thousands of ants streaming from his nose and mouth. When his arrive- You're scaring Phantom the Cat and only Phantom the Cat. (laughs) When his wife arrived on the scene, he was already dead on a stretcher. His assistant had already ordered the cremation. Where did the stretcher come where, from? With Freemason stretcher. His assistant had already ordered the cremation without consulting the widow. Carpet cleaners were already at work while the body was still laid out in front of the fireplace on the stretcher, ready to be taken out. The case of whether this was a murder was never solved. Let me get into it. Mm-hmm. What is known is that his assistant and banker, Daniel Fritz, 
befriended an elderly Hall, and a week before he passed, Fritz aided Hall in signing over his estate and research society to him instead of Hall's wife, Hmm. Marie. They went on a trip together, Fritz, the wife, and Palmer Hall, and coming back, I think it was from Santa Barbara, Fritz had tied a, like, he was towing, like, a, a trailer, and the wife was like, why are you doing this? We're going uphill. We're going to, like, the <laughs> engine, and he, he the engine's going to blow. So he pulls over and says the engine overheated, but the, the wife was like, no, it didn't. But he still finds an excuse to separate the wife and, I think, son or daughter to go one way. He takes Palmer Hall home, and then, like, the next morning is when she comes home, and he's been dead. He died, apparently, of natural causes and sleep. That happens. Now they find out that Fritz had Hall sign over his estate and the research society to him. Marie took Fritz to court where a judge was able to invalidate the will, luckily, and remove Fritz from the position of PRS. But the legal fees robbed the society of many of the artifacts and they were forced to sell to the Getty, which I mentioned earlier. Marie and many others think the six-day turnaround between signing the will and his death was too soon. They use the word pre-calculated a lot. Calculated is fine, but fine, (laughs) pre-calculated. They think it was murder to get all the money. But then why isn't True Crime LA things all over this? Why isn't this like a big group who done it? Why is it so hard to mention he died under unusual circumstances and his assistant fooled with the will? Never served any time, by the way. Got away with it. Scott free. Didn't get the money, but never served any time. The well, police looked into it. Couldn't prove anything. What are the Freemasons hiding? Why isn't this all over the internet? Why isn't Dan Brown writing a book about this? Why isn't the Da Vinci Code about this guy? That's the Philosophical Research Society. We should all go see Dr. Calgary on 60 millimeter on the 11th. I'll see you there. Stay for the refreshments and the pee-pee smashing. And the pee-pee smashing, yeah. If you don't have a pee-pee, you could just bring like a hot dog. Um, (laughs) It's like the same thing. It doesn't have to be your pee-pee. Yeah, yeah, you can bring a friend. Yeah, Bring a pee-pee carrying friend. I don't know. There, there's who knows, who knows, who knows what goes on yeah. in the basements of these quote unquote secret societies. Mm-hmm. But one thing we do know what's going on in the basement of this next secret society. Oh, we're going to. I'm so excited. Our next segment is this your segment. I don't know. Uh, turn it around. <laughs> I, don't, I don't remember. Can I show you or do I not show you? Do I show you or not show you? I don't know. We started the trick five minutes ago. No, I don't remember. I don't remember. Please help me. So this is the story of a place I've always been fascinated by, yet never gotten a hard invitation nor mm-hmm. offered to have it all comped, which is key for me. Secret society. Secret society. The Magic Castle. Yes. Rabbits everywhere. Top hats. <laughs> Mating. Yeah. Is this your card? card, <laughs> card. So you've been here. Uh huh. A couple times. You a couple times you've a been here. Times. I thought you only went once. I was dating a girl a hundred years ago. Is this your girlfriend? Is this your girlfriend? No. <laughs> uh, Not anymore. One of her friends was a magician who um, did shows there, uh, so he was able right. to get us in. It was great, and you have to go dressed up, and if you don't go dressed up, they give you an oversized coat, and you look ridiculous, and your girlfriend doesn't like you anymore. If you don't go dressed up, you have to sit in the saw in half box yeah. the whole time. Yeah, and they do pop, and they, and they do smash your pee-pee. <laughs> they use an opportunity. If to you accidentally go into the basement, they will smash, they will smash your pee-pee. Yeah. They'll cut it off, then smash it. <laughs> but it'll somehow, when you leave, be back in perfect condition. Yeah, and it's going to be a phantom pee-pee, too, because you're going to feel it, even though they're smashing it, and it's in a different room. You're going to be like, oh, I can tell that they're... This is a rabbit's pee-pee. <laughs> I didn't come in here with a rabbit's peepee. Yes, you did. <laughs> did. Your girlfriend saying, you, yes, you did. Yes, you did. So one of the most secretive places in LA yep. that everyone but me has been to. <laughs> so this uh, this one is a secret society that- I went with Matt Zombo. <laughs> <laughs> Who else picked on you? <laughs> yeah, they were there too. This is a secret society, but it, it they invite people, but there are still secrets withheld from yep. people who are not part of the society. There sure is. So the story starts with two married hicks from Wisconsin named Roland and Catherine Lane. Catherine was a teacher and also wrote a book called The Girl from Oshkosh. Uh-huh. uh-huh. Is this American Girl Doll series? <laughs> the Girl from Oshkosh, colon, a bagosh story. <laughs> <laughs> so Roland, Ro, is it Roland? It's literally like Roland, like, Roland with the Let homies? the good times Roland. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Roland was a multi-hyphenate of everything that has made LA the affordable haven that it is today. Hey, Roland with the hobbies. A banker, lawyer, real estate investor. Mm. In 1886, the two moved to Redlands and were instrumental in developing that into the desirable paradise that it is today. It is so beautiful. Yeah. Who doesn't want to live in a city named after their political party's affiliation? <laughs> <laughs> Greenlands? <laughs> They always vote green. Uh-huh. Well, actually, Greenland votes for ice. <laughs> and in Iceland, they all vote for green. So, And, and we don't like that. 
<laughs> we hate that. We hate ice. Go ahead. In Redlands, there was a particular house that was built in 1897 by Lyman Farwell and Oliver Dennis for another rich couple the Lanes were friends with that's now called the Kimberly Crest House and Gardens. It's still there. Mm-hmm. It was a, it was and is a huge Victorian mansion with turrets and points and windows oh, and cool. paint. Yeah. <laughs> it's got, Whoa, rich people, paint. It's got an in-house, Greg. <laughs> Um, it's got an innie. The Lanes absolutely loved this house. So when it came time for the Lanes to move a little further west to the burgeoning town of Hollywood, mm-hmm. Hollywood land to some, yeah. in 1902, they hired the same designers to build an exact duplicate of oh. this house at their new address, 7001 Franklin, in the heart of not yet Hollywood land. In the heart of one of the most insane streets between La Brea and Highland. The only thing there at the time was the Ripley's dinosaur. <laughs> Before he was tamed. So completed in 1909, this house, they called it the Holly Chateau. And it had 17 rooms and a roof garden. And like I said, it was an identical twin to the one in Redlands, which is still there today. But with all the additions that have been put into the Hollywood one, they're no longer twins. So they're like the basket case twins. Sure. But if you want to see what the Magic Castle originally looked like, you can go to Redlands. And please, if that is an enticement, if you didn't already need reasons to go to Redlands. Brother, they got a shakies there. They got the Flamingo Bar. They might have a Cracker Barrel. They actually do have very beautiful houses there. I drove around because when we go to Big Bear, the last stop before you climb the mountain is Redlands. So we usually get fast food. Don't they have a, a Cracker Barrel over there? They might have a Cracker. It, it's a Cracker Barrel type area. It's one of those. Oh, it's a Victorian Cracker Barrel. It's a Victorian. <laughs> The cracketh barrel. The horses still make sense. <laughs> the biscuit barrel. The biscuit yeah, the, barrel. <laughs> the rocking chairs uh, always been there. Always been there. What time is the gun show? I just missed it. What, what gun show? Redlands. Redlands. <laughs> so while in Hollywood, Roland was part of a development group that was building houses in a part of the valley then called Marion, now called Northridge. Okay. So he was one of the ones developing Northridge. He also developed Hollywood itself and the town of Corcoran. Oh, okay. The prison state of Corcoran. Yeah. So Catherine was president of the Women's Club of Hollywood okay. and was instrumental in getting the palm trees planted along Wilshire Boulevard. Wow, really? The cherry trees planted in Griffith Park. Okay. And also in establishing Olvera Street. Wow, was really? This woman. She's one of those. And she's one of those. She's one of those. She's one of those brassy broads. So in addition to being outlandishly rich, they were thankfully also very outlandishly charitable. Ah. They gave a lot to children's charities and would hold big banquet fundraisers for orphans inside the house, but no orphans inside the house. Yeah, please, please, please. You're going to track in poor. <laughs> You're going to get the rich dirty. Yeah. <laughs> so they'd hold meetings of civic organizations in the house and even book clubs. Oh. They would also have normal elite parties as well, holding banquets for visiting world leaders and just everyday elbow rubbing with the elite of the growing town of Hollywood. They had the birthday party for Carrie Jacobs Bond, who was one of the rare famous female composers of the early 1900s, who wrote the song I Love You Truly, which I only know from Edith Bunker singing it on All the Family. (laughs) I saw Edith Bunker in a movie and it really like rattled me. Uh, Was it... um, isn't she in Damn Yankees? Were you watching Damn Yankees again? I was watching the band Damn Yankees. <laughs> I think she's in the Al... The Al Bundy movie? The Al Bundy movie. I think she's in... <laughs> it's Al, just called Peg, period. The Oxbow. In, I oh, think really? She, I think she is. She's in something that I saw recently. crazy. She's either that in that or gun... Um, <laughs> Please uh, don't shoot the no. sheriff. <laughs> she's either that or in Stray Dog. So I'm going to say she's in the Kurosawa movie. She got into a big Yakuza phase. (laughs) She was a Yakuza darling in the in the 50s. That's what all the tattoos are about. You think she was a biker? No, brother. She is not. Archie was not happy when she uh, when she got that full face tattoo that says for the emperor. Archie will not have another night of sushi. (laughs) They did agree on Chinese people. though. So in 1940, Roland (laughs) died of a stroke inside the house. Oh, no. Keep that in mind. I'll tell you where later. And Catherine- I like this couple so much, though. And Catherine died in 1945, not long. Five years later. Five years later. The house was inherited by their son, Roland Jr., but was turned into apartments from 1946 to 48 that were lived in- Yeah, Greg hates affordable housing. Did you know that? I just don't think that rich people should share. Go ahead. You want to live somewhere? Go to Redlands. (laughs) More like breadlins with all the bread lines. <laughs> yeah. So these apartments were lived in mostly by students and artists because the rent was cheap, but he just wanted to sell it, the son. Right, right. One of the tenants tried to prevent that from happening. Every time he showed it off to a prospective buyer, this person would make ghost noises and say that there were bugs and everyone in there had TB. Cool. Is this Beetlejuice? <laughs> 
Yeah, he pulled his face really <laughs> long. I have a picture here. Yeah. But I can't show it on screen because it's too scary. It's too. It's just too scary. Um, We're not lazy. It's too scary. <laughs> in 1948, it was leased to a Patricia Hogan who kept it as an apartment slash hotel, but renamed it Franklin Castle. Okay. But it was just a house with a bunch of bedrooms. So the apartments all had shared bathrooms and no kitchens. This didn't last long because Hogan had a bunch of debt. So in 1949, it went back into the hands of Roland Jr., who turned it into a convalescent home for the elderly until 1955, when he sold it to a developer named Thomas Glover, who was the same guy who owned Yamashiro. Just oh, above it. just above the So thing. the same guy owned all so of they, it. So the renovations, they switched it. There was more kitchens and bathrooms. That was one bathroom yeah, and they, 17 kitchens. They had the blueprints upside down. Yeah, they shouldn't have done that. Yeah, everyone was uh, going to the... They were making number two into a blender. Yeah. <laughs> we don't know how blenders work. I thought there was a hole at the bottom. Everybody was kung fu fighting. Go ahead. I don't know what's wrong with it. I've been awake for so long. I, I did make you drink a Mountain Dew you before did. this. You and made it shows. Me. I did make you drink. Yeah, you it was made Baja me. Blast, right? I was going to bring wine for the three of us. I thought that was such a nice evening yeah. and you ruined it with your Mountain Dew Greg, Baja Blast. Mountain Dew Baja Blast is the wine of the Ozarks. <laughs> <laughs> so Thomas Glover, the guy who owned Yamashiro and yes. now this, he didn't really know what to do with it. So for the rest of the 50s, it was either just empty or it was being used as a group home for people with disabilities until 1960 when Glover was considering just demolish the whole building. What? Why are people like that? Why do people see a beautiful building like it's got to go too, slit its throat? The world is too cruel for such a beautiful building. I wish it was just an empty lot <laughs> and not a beautiful 17 room castle that someone would pay millions for. Just slowly being haunted. Yeah. It has bugs I hear. Ooh. Enter the Larson family. William W. Larson Sr. weirdly enough was also from Wisconsin from Weird. a family of canners. That's a word that has to be said with an accent. Canners. They're from. They're a bunch of canners. Hey, and their company was called was called Nice Cans. <laughs> um, at some point, William made his way out to Pasadena, where he became a criminal attorney. He cool. was Sweet James. He was the original Sweet. <laughs> yeah, James. Yeah, uh, billboards were upside down. Sweet William, Wiley William. <laughs> he defended all kinds of scum, including mafia guys. But more so than saying Johnny commits crimes was innocent, his true passion. Was magic. Whoa, the magic of the courtroom. <laughs> the magic of the American justice system. You watch your rights disappear. Is this your objection? <laughs> Sustained. Nah, damn. I thought it would work. Watch as I saw this sentence in half. <laughs> um, he loved watching magic. He loved performing magic. He would do magic tricks in the courtroom Whoa. during trials, like in night court. Hold him in contempt. <laughs> Arrest this man. And then he keeps I'll just like get out. Yeah. <laughs> I can get out of any contempt. <laughs> and he had the perfect wife in Geraldine, who was a lover and performer of magic herself. Okay. And she wasn't just a magician's assistant. She was actually performing as the magician, which was rare for women at yeah. the time to be doing that. That's she, cool. She's like Gypsy Rosalie. She even became the first woman to do magic on TV in the late 30s wow. on her own show called The Magic Lady, which just as surprising, there was TV in the late 30s. It was a Nickelodeon. She was on the. She was on a, a reel between the news, it. yeah, and Mickey. Which a lot of people did. First woman on TV. <laughs> uh, uh, I'm gonna crank it. Um, <laughs> I only have so many hands. My name is Fred Willard, and I'm going to crank it. I, I have so much more love for magicians' assistants more than magicians. It's like a the nurse is doing all the hard work. Exactly. It's like sixty forty. <laughs> In the late 20s, William started writing for a magic-centric magazine called Sphinx Magazine until 1936 when he and his wife started a magazine of their own called Genie, with two eyes. Okay. The Conjurer's Magazine, which covered all things magic and is actually still around today and is the longest continually running magic magazine in the world. And the competition for that title is fierce. <laughs> you know, it's crazy. I dream of Genie. Go ahead. Continue, please. I dream of subscribing to Genie. <laughs> Eventually, William quit defending murderers and devoted himself to magic full time. Ma sorry, magic, magic full time, and hit the road with his wife and their two sons, Bill Jr. and Milt, <laughs> and performed a family magic show around Southern California That's called the cool. Larson Family of Magicians. I would have loved to see that. There, there needs to be more families of magicians in current LA. There do. Why aren't there more magician families? <laughs> Listen. Why is there more magician families? I know a place we can look to find them. I know a parking lot we can stand in when we while they park. Please invite me. Yeah, invite please. me in. I'm, I'm a magic vampire. Please <laughs> invite me in. And then World War II hit and Houdini got punched down into bullets. <laughs> they weren't able to. And Houdini swallowed a bunch of bullets because it was a thing. And then that kid hit him and he died and he died with a bunch of bullets. But him. he spat. The kid died too. <laughs> yeah. 
It's like a Bugs Bunny cartoon when he shoots Hitler. <laughs> they weren't able to travel as freely around the country anymore. So they settled down and bought the Thayer Magic Company, which was just a guy's house at 929 South Longwood near the Miracle Mile. It was a house on the outside, but on the inside, it was a home. Uh, <laughs> it was it was a it was a I hate the outside of my house is what I'm saying. It was a secret magic shop with a magic studio to perform in for those in the no. know was this house. A house with a secret magic society inside. Hmm. Mm. Oh, what a novel idea. Yeah, strange. In April 1951, William got the idea to start a society for magicians, much like the UFO guy, for magicians to share ideas and connect with the mission of advancing the art of magic in America and bringing recognition to magicians all over the world. Cool. And to prepare society for the coming of wizards. <laughs> So that we wouldn't shoot them at, uh, when we first saw them. We have to fight the witches somehow. Is this your fate? <laughs> That's tarot. You're describing so, tarot. It's all magic. Yeah, it's all the same crap. He called it the Academy of Magical Arts and Scientists. Okay. Scientists. Scientists, scientists not yeah. scientists. We're going to study scientists. It's Dr. Doom. You're describing Dr. Doom. All genie subscribers were granted automatic membership, which is the magic of the post office. <laughs> Sadly, William didn't get to advance his mission very far because he died in 1953 oh, no. at the age of 48. There's a bunch of men who die in the story and I don't want them to. Yeah, they do die pretty young. Yeah. Um, and some Magic. I mean, magic eats your soul. <laughs> the devil claims them young. Bill Jr. and Geraldine, who was the mom, continued publishing Genie. Ab I keep wanting to see it as Benji. <laughs> yeah, that's not it. Which I also subscribe to Benji magazine. <laughs> it is what you think. They kept publishing Genie after his death, but they couldn't keep the Academy running because it was a lot of work. And Bill Jr. was a producer at CBS now. Oh, was he? Uh, which is the magic of show business. <laughs> so Bill Jr., he didn't have enough time for that. Neither did the younger son, Milt, because this apparently showbiz family kept the Nepo babies working as Milt was now a writer for the TV game show Truth or Consequences, which was hosted by Bob Barker. Oh, okay. And is also the reason there's a town in New Mexico called Truth or Consequences, which is a whole other story. That's weird. But Milt's office was on one of the... So he's writing for this show, Truth or Consequences. Yeah. His office was on one of the top floors of a building at Hollywood and Highland. And when he'd oh. be sitting there, all he sat on top of the elephant from... Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. What is, what's the movie called? Like Obstruction or... Obstru Obstruction of Justice? Yeah, what uh, Intolerance. Intolerance, that's what it is. Is intolerance not an obstruction to civilization? Go ahead. Sustained. Sustained. <laughs> so he'd be sitting there all day thinking of new ways Bob Barker could tell you to spay your pets. Uh -huh. And he'd be staring out his window looking west. And what did he see here? His castle. The old Lane residence, a.k.a. the Holly Chateau, which as we left it off was being considered for demolition. Yeah. Storylines converge. Uh -huh. Is this your storyline? <laughs> Is the C storyline and the B storyline going to <laughs> smash into each other? Milt fell in love with this decrepit old building and he started having fantasies about resurrecting his dad's old dream of a magician's academy complete with a special members only clubhouse. I love this. He floated this idea by his brother and the two, uh, he levitated this <laughs> idea by his brother and the two approached the owner of the building who was just going to knock it down anyway. So he leased it to them and the dream was on. Wait, 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 before you go on. Yeah. Light as a feather, stiff as a board meeting. Go ahead. That's how they have to start every board meeting. Go ahead, please. A Ouija board meeting. <laughs> so the building was in awful condition. They didn't have a ton of money. So the brothers and some friends set about repairing it themselves. Okay. With in, magic. With magic. Well, their friends were, uh, they got a a broom and they made it uh, sentient yeah. and it started, it started scooping all this water. It, it's a long story. It, yeah, it, it was, I mean, he shouldn't have taken all those shortcuts. Yeah, he should, also shouldn't have tried to chop it with uh, yeah. into a million pieces. We actually did, they did have to shoot all the brooms though. And some of them were children. And some of them had children. Yeah. They were babies having babies, the brooms. Some of them were only dust busters. <laughs> so this was September 1961. They started renovating this old house. But to go with the clubhouse, they needed to have a club. Right. Milt convinced Bill Jr. to resurrect their dad's academy. So that same year, he formed a nonprofit called the Academy of Magical Arts, Inc. And once again, all Genie subscribers were made members, as well as his showbiz coworkers and magic friends. Uh, which all of my friends are magic. Yeah. But, and as all good leaders do, he made himself president for life. Oh. No elections allowed. Dictator. Is this your free will? <laughs> uh, and he crumbles it. <laughs> um, is this your independence? It took almost two years, but at 5 p.m. on January 2nd, 1963, the castle, as it was called, officially opened. And H.H. H. Holmes was so happy. Oh, wait, the different castle. But <laughs> it's the same one. Yeah. No, it was the same one. <laughs> they modeled, it used to be a twin of that building in Redlands. They modeled it as a twin of H.H. H. Holmes's <laughs> it's castle. It's actually a triplet. <laughs> the forgotten uh, triplet. 
It's the Elizabeth Olsen of the yeah. um, when it walk in furnace. Is this your skin? <laughs> uh, when it first opened, there wasn't much to it. It was just a bar and a room for close up magic, but uh-huh. it was a place for magicians to congregate. Yeah. But as the years, I love went, the idea of a magician's hangout. Yeah. Isn't yeah. that really cool? But as the well, it's still there. It is cool. It currently is. You cool. got to go there. Twice. No, but I mean, like nobody shows up. Like there's no crowd. Right. Yeah, the idea of, of a clubhouse yeah. uh, where it's just it's just the boys. You yeah, know? it's just the boys. We drink a couple of Coors Lights. But as the years went on and membership grew, they were able to expand what the castle had to offer. Uh-huh. They started eating into the parking lot and eating in the parking lot and building new wings onto the original building, eventually turning it into a building that has 13 different stages for magic, yeah. five bars, a restaurant that can hold 150 people, and a library that holds, among other things, some of Houdini's original notes. Wow, that's crazy. That's really weird. Yeah, There's also the ultra-exclusive Houdini seance room that costs a ridiculous amount of money but includes dinner for 10 to 12 people where you're guided through a seance to attempt to contact Houdini. Right. You have to wear uh, boxing gloves in <laughs> case you get through to him. Um, this is a, a nod to how, if you remember, Houdini's wife used to hold mm-hmm. seances on to Halloween. communicate with him on Halloween on the roof of the Knickerbocker Hotel. Yeah. Inside this room are also Houdini memorabilia, including a straitjacket and shackles that he once used. Oh, that's so cool. Um, and also the fist that killed him. Yeah, is, they cut uh, that kid's hand off. Yeah, it's it's pickled. <laughs> <laughs> the building is also jam-packed with Los Angeles history and memorabilia. Mm-hmm. On the outside, the lights along the driveway used to be on the Venice Pier. Oh, really? And there's also cast iron work taken from the Masonic Temple on Wilshire, which right. we were talking about before this recording. Yeah. Then on the inside, there are paintings Paintings that once belonged to William Randolph Hearst, mm-hmm. chandeliers from the first Bullocks downtown. Oh, one of the bar tops is made of the old gym floor of Hollywood High School. Uh-huh. You can still smell uh, John Ritter's sweat. <laughs> They have the original backdrop from The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson. Wow, I love that backdrop. They have the bar from the movie Hello, Dolly. Mm -hmm. They have a bar named after W.C. Fields with his old pool table in it. Oh, I didn't know that. That's why they got so mad at you when you scratched (laughs) repeatedly on it. In the basement, they have an original concept ghost effect that designer Yale Gracie made for the Haunted Mansion ride as a prototype to show how they could make the ghosts running around the ballroom effect. Yeah. Gracie gave this as a gift to the club, but a ton of Disney people have been involved with this place over the years, and it's suspected that its design inspired the design of the Haunted Mansion. Mansion. I can feel, I feel that way. From the outside, it certainly looks like yeah, it, and from, from pictures I've seen of the inside. There's not supposed to be pictures of the inside. First of all, spies, and they should be shot. <laughs> uh, this is a secret society. What's the piano's name? Irma? We'll get into Irma a little okay. bit. And Irma will get into us. <laughs> I'm going to be possessed at the end of this episode so, yeah. by Irma. <laughs> um, but tons of behind the scenes and in front of the camera people have been members of this place over the years. Orson Welles used to perform in this house. I w- imagine how cool that would be to see Orson Welles performing there. Mr. Welles, I'd like to buy you a hot dog. Yeah, I'm going to make these 40 hot dogs disappear. <laughs> Is this your appetite? <laughs> you have the whole room's appetite, Mr. Welles. The man in front of the backdrop, Johnny Carson, mm-hmm. used to go there. Cary Grant, Tony Curtis, David Blaine, Ooh. Penn and Teller, Siegfried and Roy, Jason Alexander. Neil Patrick Harris was the president for four years of the Magic Castle. Mm-hmm. But the thing that really draws people in is the mystery of it and the whimsy contained yeah, inside. the whimsy is pretty cool. There are secret doors all over the place that lead random places and you enter... Again, H.H. H. Holmes. Mm-hmm. And you even <laughs> enter it all by saying open sesame to an owl on a bookshelf that then opens up for you. I wouldn't cool. know. Greg would know. I wouldn't know. I've never gotten to say open sesame to anything in my life. No, there was a, for that jar of sesame. Is, yeah, well, the joke I was going to make. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Is this your punchline? <laughs> um, there's magic shows breaking out all around you when yeah. you're there. So I hear. There's the piano playing ghost Irma who can play, somehow can play any song that yeah. you request. It's pretty cool. You've experienced Irma. Mm-hmm. So she did what you asked her to do? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Irma, please give me a kiss. You, <laughs> Irma, please. In the God of Vita, all 18 minutes of it. You're a ghost. You don't get tired. I remember hearing Teddy Bear Picnic on it and being really excited. You asked for it or did yeah. you ask Irma anything? Uh, she said, what's your favorite song? I said, Teddy Bear Picnic. Wait, she she talks? I think she talks. Or she makes some kind of, there's some sort of call and response oh, so happening. so it's like Jaws. Like a little bit, yeah. It's a One for yes. Yeah, it's like a seance. The lore behind Irma is that she was a frequent guest of the house in the Lane family days mm-hmm. and would play the piano all the time, but Roland hated it. So he moved the piano to the third floor where she couldn't get to it. <sighs> and she was so insulted that she vouched that she would haunt the place with music when she died. So that's the story behind that's Irma. That's great. I like that. 
I'm on Irma's side. So the secretive nature of this place and the way they play with LA history mm-hmm. is really something special. And one of the reasons why it was made an LA historic landmark in 1989. And I do appreciate that. It seems like a place that they have LA artifacts, but they understand the history of LA mm-hmm. and play that up and involve it in their, in their own lore. In their own lore, yeah. It's in the same league as like Bob Baker and the Breakfast Club, yes. like these historic, whimsical places that are... Yes, this is like the nighttime yeah. breakfast yeah, the nighttime club. This breakfast. is the dinner club. <laughs> but a place like this in a month like this wouldn't be without its spookies. Yes. Ghosts have been seen throughout the house. There have been a few seen at the Hat and Hair pub in there and also a little girl in the cellar ah. who is not part of the haunted mansion <laughs> display. <laughs> There have also been a few deaths inside the house. Oh, no. In 1986, a magician died while waiting to go on stage, as opposed to what we normally would do and die on stage. <laughs> hey, no respect. Boy. Is this your self-esteem? <laughs> <laughs> He's supposedly one of the ghosts now. In 2017, another magician sadly took his own life oh, in no. one of the dressing rooms before going on stage. The room where the strangest things seem to have happened is the Houdini room. Okay. People have reported a lot of strange things happening during the seances, of course. Yeah. And if you'll remember, the original owner died in the house, but I refuse to tell you where before. It was in the Houdini. Whoa. That was his old bedroom. So wow. he died in the Houdini seance room. Wow. Then for Halloween 2011, this is what this sort of thing is one of my favorite I'm not an arsonist, but this is one of my favorite sorts of things that happen. If you'll understand that in Halloween 2011, I think it's irony. I don't know. They decorated the castle to look like it was on fire Uh and they were promoting it as the magic castle will be on fire with the spirit of Halloween. And then it caught on fire. Oh my God. (laughs) So, and this was- The gasling was just ambiance. I didn't know. I like the smell. Yeah. This happened October 31st, 2011. Kidding. A fire broke out in the Dante room. Is that irony again? I don't know. <laughs> Causing extensive damage to the entire building. So Dante was a magician that Houdini hated. This is who the, the, okay. it's named after. Yeah. Houdini hated Dante. And oddly, one of the rooms untouched by the fire, Phantom jumped up for effect, Yeah, was the Houdini room. Wow. Completely untouched Weird. by the fire. Even weirder to remember, October 31st was Houdini's mm-hmm. death day. Yeah. And the fire was said to have broken out at the time of his death. And that was the night for every night for 10 years his wife was trying. Where, what building did she go it on? It was the the roof of the Knickerbocker Hotel. where she would go, yeah. Yeah, they had a deal of, if you if you don't remember that episode, it, it was like, I think it was more than 10 or maybe nine or 10 years where yeah, before years. Houdini died, before he got punched in the stomach by a little boy. Um, <laughs> somewhat- it's so much funnier that it's a little boy. <laughs> In like Buster Brown's. (laughs) Hey, Mr. Houdini. (laughs) The deal was, he said, if anyone could communicate from beyond the grave, it's me. Yeah. So if I die, give it nine or 10 years, whatever it is. Yeah. And if you don't hear from me, then there is no way to communicate. But what if he got his ghostly coordinates wrong and it was actually at the Magic Castle? And yeah, he's like, well, oh, damn it. I could, I, do, I just need to cross Franklin. Oh, it was the Bocker Knicker Hotel. <laughs> oh. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. But yeah, so they say this, uh, some people say that this was Houdini finally communicating yeah. from the on the grave, but maybe sent a butterfly or something <laughs> next time, Houdini. Wait, what, there's no phones? <laughs> Can't haunt a phone line like every like like three Twilight Zone episodes. My phone has certainly died before. <laughs> it must be there with you. Yeah, 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 yeah. Is yeah, yeah. this your <laughs> is this your bad joke? <laughs> then there were the not so spooky but definitely scarier things. Between 2011 and 2019, 12 former employees and magicians came forward accusing members of the staff and management of the Magic Castle of sexual harassment, oh, sh- sexual assault, and discrimination. Waitresses were groped. Some women volunteers for tricks felt taken advantage of. Others were fired for speaking out about this. Uh. Inappropriate gifts were given. Women were pressured to get drunk. People who weren't white men were discriminated Uh. against. The general manager during this time, Joseph Furlow, was the man cultivating this boys club culture, but he finally resigned in 2020. And from what I can tell, things have changed for the better. Okay. Something that was troubling was that since the opening of this place as a magic clubhouse, it was still only leased, which in LA, always means someone's going to someone's going to demolish yeah eventually. someone's going to kick you out and try to build a apartment complex yeah there. it's going to be a, a marijuana store <laughs> uh with apartments on top and a little plaque that says the magic castle yeah, was magic here castle. okay we love history they'll have a strain of magic yeah. castle <laughs> marijuana yeah in dedication and owner so i think something similar is going on with yamashiro right now where the future is shrouded 
<sighs> the Academy had been planning to buy the property, but the pandemic completely derailed that. But then in 2022, it was bought by Randy Pitchford, who is the guy who owns the company that makes the Borderlands video games. Uh -huh. He's been a magician his whole life, and he got married okay. at the Magic Castle. All so right. while it's not yet in the hands of the Academy itself, this is at least, That's it seems something. safe for now. But then again, nothing, nothing ever is, is actually ever safe. safe yeah. Today, the castle is open every night from 5 p.m. to 1 a.m. with shows going on throughout each night. There's also a brunch Saturday and Sunday from 10 to 3. Reservations only. Entrance fee is $40 to $45 per person, depending on the day. Then you have to valet park mm -hmm. and buy one entree per person, which, come on. And you want a valet park because there's no water park around there. No, I'm going to park at Hollywood and Highland, no, like I, in the intersection. I'm going to dress really nice and then walk through Hollywood. Yeah, I'm going to come dripping in sweat. Yeah. There is a strict dress code and yep. no photos or videos are allowed anywhere nope. further than the lobby. They also host special events. They give lessons. There's fellowships and they have awards each year, including Magician of the Year, Best Stage Magician, Best Parlor Magician, Best Bar Magician, and Best Comedy Magician. Wow. I, I think I could win that because I would make all the laughs disappear. Mm, that's funny. That's yeah. really good. That's great. Yeah. That's that's good. Is this your award? <laughs> uh, no. It's not. <laughs> And on the board of directors is Larry Wilmore from The Daily Show. Oh, my God. It's a Mecca. It's Mecca. Not a Mecca. It's Mecca <laughs> yeah. for magicians. But the caveat to all this wonderment and the reason it's in this episode is that you cannot go in and have the secrets revealed to you unless you are a member mm -hmm. or invited by a member. Yeah. The types of membership are magician, where you're a qualified, actively practicing magician, either as a career or a hobby. You still you have to audition and be approved by the committee to be accepted. You could also be at this level as a non-magician if you have dedicated yourself to magic on more than a superficial level, whatever that means. Yeah, whatever that means. You've volunteered for at least five Siegfried and Roy shows. <laughs> Siegfried and Roy. That's just a strong man one. <laughs> That's when they lift weights. There are about 2,500 people in the world in this magician team. Wow. Then there's the associate level who are lovers of magic or friends of magicians who must be approved by the board of directors and pay a steep fee. Then there's the honorary level, which is given to world famous people who have contributed to the advancement of the art of magic. Then there's the junior level, which is for qualified magicians between 13 and 20 who are actively practicing magic at an advanced level and have also passed an audition. This was the level that Doogie Hauser was on before he became oh, president. Oh, that makes sense. President Hauser. President Hauser, yeah. In all, there's only about 5,000 members of the Academy of Magical Arts, but a special trick to get into the Magic Castle as a muggle like us. Uh -huh. Stay at the neighboring Magic Castle hotel and you get entry and all it costs you is the normal fees plus an extra $400 to stay at the hotel Great. for a night. So someone get me in there Let's and go. also comp me. And you, yeah, 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 I need to get in for free yeah. and I need chicken wings. Yeah, what's the cheapest entree? Can yeah. I just order ketchup? <laughs> is that an entree? <laughs> so yeah, that's a, that's a few secret societies for Halloween. I love the Magic Castle. I wish I knew a magician that can get me in. Anybody listening that wants to take old Greggy Beans and the Daniel cartoon, Beans and Daniel Beans, the cartoon cats, <laughs> please. You know, I didn't, I knew a little bit about the Magic Castle. I didn't realize, because as I was reading it, like you made the connection, this reminds me so much of, of, uh, the Breakfast Club, Bob Baker, Old Town Music Hall. Like this is an extension of those places, yeah. but like expensive. Sure, sure. It's the, it's, yeah. But I would love to go. It sounds so fun. Mm -hmm, yeah. It's, uh, yeah. Somebody get us in. <laughs> it's more you than me. You think so? I think so. Because I own a suit. Because you own a suit. No, you own a suit. I Because, you're, because of you, I own yeah, a suit. you own a suit because, because of, of you, yeah. I gave you my old bar mitzvah yeah. suit. <laughs> but it's just like, you, you love magic and old things, so this is like... You love that too. I, maybe I, mean, I, I, I guess I love magic more than you do, but you love bars. I do love bars. <laughs> I would drink it at every one of those bars if I, I was in there right now. Yeah, I do love magic. I do get a little nervous of being chosen. Sure. Actually, you know what? Weirdly enough, that's going to come up again, but... um. I do get nervous of being chosen yeah. uh, at a magic show. Sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I'm afraid that the devil will enter me. And what if it's not the way that I like to get entered? Yeah, what if it, What if it's the not the devil that I like? Yeah. <laughs> it's certainly like uh, you're going to be made a fool of in front of everybody. Like, oh, I thought it was actually in my hand, but he had it in his hand. Right, yeah, there was a quarter behind my ear the whole time. But like, you have to like be fast. Like, you have to like get their jokes and get their vibes. And if you're going to look like a big dumb, dumb, if you don't. Yeah. I'm going to be laughed out of the magic castle sure. and then there will be a mysterious fire. I don't know yeah. who started it, but yeah, no, I, I, I would love to go yeah. to this place. You should, we should find a way to get you in. Let's get in. Let's get in. Let's get it. It's our year. The, this is, this is the year of the magician. This is the year of the magician. So, uh, before we get to our listener question, yes. uh, pre listener question, plug, sure. 
again, by our calendar, mm-hmm. the 2025 lived and died in LA calendar. And I, I usually wouldn't say by our calendar, but last year we didn't print calendars and I got a lot of guff from people about not having calendars. It's so you so know what? Weird. Buy calendars. We are a calendar company that has a podcast on the side. <laughs> I know. This is our big money yeah, maker. Yeah, this is our money maker. <laughs> we could print a book with the amount of money that we make from this. But yeah, email us, la.meekly mm-hmm. at gmail.com. Website, lameeklypodcast.com slash contact. Yeah. Instagram, LA underscore meekly. $35 shipping included, 2025 calendar. It'll get you ready for the spooky season. Spooky season is upon us. So now we have our listener question. And this is from, I believe it's your cousin, mm-hmm. Vero Mango. My dear old cousin, Veronica. Oh, her name is a mango. Uh, no, no. Uh, I'll check her birth certificate. Uh, yeah. yeah, I'd like to. I'm a. I'm a Veronica birther. Yeah, birther. Yeah. I'd like to. I believe her name is Mango. <laughs> so she asks, which LA mystery do you most want solved in your lifetime? And I feel like this is more of a question for you than for mm-hmm. me. I mean, I know mine. And Tell me yours. I mean, who killed Elizabeth Short? It's not an of accident. Course. It was incredibly intentional. The it, placement. No, no, it was an accident. No, I she think it's a car did that. Um, she I've, went to the Magic Castle and got sawed in half. Yeah, she was a magician's assistant. Yeah, no, that's the one. I mean, there's a lot of mysteries out there that I would love solved, but that's the one that is so intentional and vicious. And if you found out who did it, you can. I wonder if you'd be able to track similar things that have happened to other people, or if this is person's. I mean, this is a gross phrase, but is this this person's magnum opus? Is this their like? grand kill right or was it just one of many or just one yeah or was it was it one time he did it one time and then it just like became like a dentist somewhere i would love to know who the name it's like like jake gyllenhaal at the end of zodiac like i just want to look him right. in the face and see like i want to but that's i mean that's you my know one. it was actually drew carey's brother from the <laughs> drew carey show i you know so i was trying to think really hard about mysteries because the elizabeth short thing i'm not as uh uh sickly obsessed with it as you are but <laughs> I don't care who killed her. I don't care. Uh, so what if it was me? I don't care. <laughs> I was trying, because I even looked back of like, what did we cover in our Unsolved Mysteries episode? Oh, right. And I guess the one, because I was really trying to think, and I guess the one that I'm most interested in is the Sal- Salomon family. Yeah. Because it was so mysterious yeah. and happened across the street from my mm-hmm. middle school. So it's got a weird personal connection. Yeah. I guess that, but honestly, my real answer and this comes back to being at a magic show. So one time I was, I don't know, I was probably 10 or something. Uh-huh. And I saw this woman in half. <laughs> there used to be a magic club at City Walk. Okay. And I went to a show and I was chosen uh-huh. in the audience. And the magician, I don't, I, somehow a bottle of ketchup was brought up oh on stage. And the magician took the bottle of ketchup, put it in a brown paper bag, uh-huh. and then crumbled up the bag and there was no ketchup. And then he gave me the bag. And I kept that bag for weeks looking in it. Like, yeah. when is the ketchup going to show back up? <laughs> so this is the mystery. More so, I mean, let's put Elizabeth Short aside. Who cares? She's fine, yeah. Tell me, where did the ketchup go? <laughs> the guy who got me into the Magic Castle when we were hanging out at his apartment did a magic trick for us. And I think I've told you this before. I might have even said this on the podcast. But he gave me a can of... No, he gave me a quarter. Okay. He's like, grab a quarter and squeeze it as hard as you can. And I could feel the quarter in my hand. <laughs> He gets a tub out. He gets a can of soda and a knife. Okay. And he's, he's standing in the tub in his kitchen. He stabs the the can of soda and rips the aluminum open and spills all of the soda out. And I hear a ding. <laughs> and I'm like, that's how well, you preloaded a quarter. And I, as I hear the ding, I squeeze my fist to make sure, yeah, the quarter's still in here. And he grabs the quarter and he's like, open your fist. And I opened it and the quarter wow. wasn't in my hand anymore. Wow. Yeah. I think that's the guy who killed Elizabeth <laughs> Short. <laughs> I think mystery solved. How did he drain the blood? The tub. <laughs> and guess what was in the ketchup bottle? <laughs> See, that's the sort of thing I want to see at the Magic yeah. Castle. I want to be given a quarter. Yeah, there's so many, like, what is it up close magic up, stuff. Yeah, that's yeah. up close. Up close stuff that I literally, like, I mean, like, uh, my coworker, Manny, is, is practices magic. He's really good. Can he get us in? I, I want to take him. And then once he, like, starts no, you take me. <laughs> uh, he gets in. He's like, I love this. I want to be a magician. He starts going there. We get in more often. This is our eight year plan to get into the magic. This is castle. our eight year plan. It's going to cost three thousand dollars. <laughs> he just does up close magic for us, and it's the simplest. And I feel like such a hayseed. Oh yeah. Every single time, I'm like just like a giggling moron. Yeah. Like, it sends, uh, what? <laughs> this never became one of my stand up jokes, but like I think I'm so intellectual, and then I see in, uh, identical twins, and I turn into a hillbilly. Like I'm what two people. 
Is there two a mirror? How are you face? doing this? Yeah, I, I, I'm such a, a simp. Is there a mirror? Yeah. Well, yeah, those are our mysteries. Who yeah. killed Elizabeth Short and where did the ketchup go? Yeah. <laughs> e- equally mysterious. <laughs> equally important to equally this city's important. justice system. So, yeah, that's uh, some secret societies to get you in the Halloween mood. Yes. I'm go- I'm ready. I'm I, ready for I've October. been ready. I mean, I bought my costume in September. <laughs> I was so ready to, and I'm going to wear it a lot. It's just a skeleton onesie. I'm going to put a shirt on top of it, like a button up, but I'm ready. I also bought a skeleton onesie. Uh-huh. So if we get caught out on Halloween, both dressed as skeleton onesies, I don't know. They're going to make us bone. Uh, they're yeah. going to think we're twins. <laughs> Uh, and if we come up across a hayseed, what do they call them? Um, oaky. If we come across an oaky, they're gonna they're gonna go running back to wherever an oaky comes from. <laughs> I don't know, Okihoma. <laughs> so yeah, enjoy Halloween. Mm-hmm. Get a little spooky. Let Get us our know calendar. what you do. Let us know what you do. Send tag us, us. Tag us. I have promoted so many places around Burbank and the Valley. Yes. Of, to, so let me know when you go to these. Yeah, things. let us know what you do. I'm just curious what everyone's doing for our. Yeah, the let October us know. Season. Did you kill Elizabeth Short and did you take the ketchup bottle? I want same guy. Same, same, same guy. Same guy. Same monster. So we'll see you in uh, no, no, November, November for our uh, traditions, traditions episode that episode you're going to write for us. You Thank you. Us. I get to nap. Enjoy Halloween. Yeah, I get to join Halloween. I don't have to do anything for anybody <laughs> ever again. <laughs> so that's been yet another episode of LA Meekly. Is this your catchphrase? No. Oh. Is this your catchphrase? Mm, this is the episode no. that went on for yeah, seven hours. Yeah, for 16 minutes. <laughs> Okay, Since bye. 2013.